sisters and brothers, as we gather in the welcome of God's love, as we gather in the joy of our unity in Christ, as we gather in the power of the Spirit. Let us listen for the voice of God. Let us worship God who has spoken and still speaks to all those who wait for the whisper of the Holy One. Amen.
Will you join us in prayer? So my young Joe Room to Moikne no scrap the time. Probably died to pray to Mukum Jung Yomai. To Mukum Joe Nichim Poor Prong, she pray a little Otting prayer. Just like little Otting Snipe. To Mukum to two squall. Tatumum Traka Trung. But good Trung High. That look great and moon. Bans touched Teno. How you but two mungum junk yum, I run no ban, got a sa, preaches an arab of Hong Trong die. Two mungum and I nung. Runo, the two men took nay, she but no pant any ban, dog me and trong no lie. By die, two mungum som, yung trong mock, but trong ban and churn, I two mungum chone, chum poor prong, die me and two tie. Oh, net, I know it pruy. How it took one ey. Chon mock, I can yum. ហើយរៀននឹងខ្ញុំចោះបីដាយទូមង្គមដឹងថាទូមង្គមកំពុងតែចូលនៃចំពោះប្រង by die, go and so prong, go and win and put your number of pong prong. No time, the bond and crook and lighting off. By die, two mum dung tie. For sun back me and trung. No two mum cum, man eye and cheer, pitch and guru, kinny ban no lie. Some prong come sanchet, some prong the tool man took. Pro loo, dog bomb own, dial ban chat chen, be pant day, the sarge and moony pong die. Madong tear con chonage and poor prong, the nut chong champ, be the wide of bop pong, two mungum jung yum and put your number of bop pong prong, that twice some rap gang ear of bop pong prong, some rap sick day song crew, nung the nung or a bop pong trong, some prong proud and whiny. Tabam long, perhaps they rob pong trong, some come out to mungum let top nut and whine a mui, that trong pan for tin pot or two mungum, now smack pitch at no lie. Eternal God, whose presence can be ours when we call upon you in spirit and in truth, open our hearts, our hands, that we would not withhold the best part. Rather, may we be willing to give all we can so others can know the victory we have found through Christ Jesus. Then, Lord, grant us that which the world cannot give joy without measure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gracious God, I echo what Brother Peter has said in giving of ourselves. Lord, we thank you for those who have given of themselves, given of their lives, given of their service, to protect the freedoms that we have come to almost take for granted here. Lord, we thank you that you have given us the blessing of being in this country where we can freely worship you. Let us never take that for granted. Let us never take the sacrifices and the work that veterans have put in to make this possible for granted. Today, we thank you, Lord, for each and every one of their lives and all of their service. We also thank you today for those who have been first responders here on our soil, those who have run towards danger instead of away from it, whether they be fires or people who would do harm to others or people in great need. We thank you for all of their service today as well. And Lord, it is a reminder and an example to us that we can give of ourselves in your name. That our lives can be lives of service. We might not go to another country to fight a foreign war or stand a ground atop a wall here, but that does not mean that we cannot serve. For every time we look to those in need and go towards them instead of away from them, we serve. Every time we see that there is danger and people that need our help, and we sacrifice ourselves in order to help others, we serve. 
And Lord, we serve because we serve because of the example that Jesus has given to us as a servant. When his disciples ask who's the greatest, he said, the greatest is like a child. The greatest is like a servant. The last shall be first. And so, Lord, help us to keep these examples in our minds today as we seek to find ways in which we can strive not to be the best, not to be the most powerful, the most in charge, but the most serving, the most contributive, the most giving, the most loving. We are eternally grateful for sending Jesus into our world to teach these examples, to give us so much more of your presence in our lives and in our world. We thank you for the sacrifices that he made. We thank you that the sacrifices included his very own life, a life that was given so that we might live. For this, we are eternally grateful. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Open hearts, oh let the
If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if you two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Dear God, we thank you today for forgiveness. We thank you for the meaning that it has in our lives to know that in you we can be forgiven and that you also give us the example for forgiveness. Dear God, we ask that you would guide us, that you would teach us, that you would make us open to learn and to understand today. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you ever get into fights with your siblings when you were a kid? Well, if you're a parent, I'd ask, have you ever had to put up with your own kids fighting with each other? Whether they're still at home with you or whether that's a memory from long ago. Well, kids get in fights. And you would hope that they would grow out of this kind of behavior. But what happens when they become teenagers? Well, they just get into bigger fights, don't they? Well, when I was a youth pastor, there were two teenage boys in my youth group, John and Carlos. They were the best of friends. They hung out all the time. They went to the same school. They were in the same grade. They lived across the street from each other. They um, were brothers in Christ as well. I even had the privilege and the honor to baptize both of them together on the same day. But in addition to being the best of friends, uh, John and Carlos were also the class clowns. They were always the life of the party. They would egg each other on. They would get too hyper. They would get in trouble. But it was pretty typical teenage boy mischievous stuff. Nothing that we couldn't handle in our youth group. They never hurt anyone, they never hurt anything, they were just best buds. But then, once upon a time at youth group, it happened. My dear, innocent wife, Lisa, was the key witness. She was there. You see, our youth group was split into three or four small groups that evening, and Lisa just happened to be the adult leader for the group that John and Carlos were a part of. And they had been kind of goofing off all that night, egging each other on, but it hadn't been a big problem so far. It was just that typical teenage boy mischief, nothing that we couldn't handle. So there's Lisa walking behind John and Carlos, moving from one activity to the next, when all of a sudden, boom, John pushed Carlos into a door jam. John was just goofing around, but it turned out that he really hurt his friend Carlos. 
because he hit his face pretty hard. And so immediately, what did Carlos do? Well, he hauls off and punches his friend in the jaw. And then this all-out brawl broke out. They were just fighting. It was straight up eye for an eye, tooth for tooth type of action. Well, you don't mess around when my Lisa is on the clock, okay? And uh, she somehow got in there and separated these two guys from each other and brought them to me right away. Well, they had only been at it for a whopping 10 seconds or so, but already you could tell that Carlos was developing a black eye. And John didn't look that good either. These guys were angry at each other. They were upset. And even though they were the best of friends, they didn't even want to look at each other. And as soon as we got the facts straight, I forced them to talk to each other. It was pretty clear that John had started the fight. And as it turned out, he actually felt really bad about it. So looking Carlos straight in the eye, his black eye, John said he was sorry and asked for forgiveness. What do you think Carlos said? Well, Carlos forgave his friend, and he even asked for forgiveness himself. So they shook hands, and they were able to move on. And as far as I know, they are still friends to this very day. Well, kids get into fights, don't they? And certainly teenagers do also. And if you think that adults don't get into fights, then you must be living under a rock or something like that, oblivious to reality. Did you know that even upstanding, baptized Christians who tune in to live streaming church services also get into fights? Sure, it can happen in youth group, but it also happens with grown-ups too. Except we give it a nicer, more politically correct name, and that is conflict. And so in the church, we need what is called conflict resolution because we are supposed to be the community of forgiveness. Amen? The place where conflicts are resolved. But it's not easy to do that. It's not easy at all. That is why Jesus gives the church some very clear steps for bringing about forgiveness. That's the big idea today today and next week, actually, that Jesus gives us clear steps for bringing about forgiveness. We are continuing today to study Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus calls the church to be the community of forgiveness. And in today's passage in particular, he talks about what to do specifically when one member of the community sins against another person in a hard-hearted and unrepentant type of way. These are tough situations, folks, that end up causing conflicts between believers, between brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why, as we learned last time, you need to approach these situations with three things. First, a foundation of childlike humility. Second, with a desire to not cause others to stumble. And third, imitating the heart of God who desires restoration rather than separation. Well, so just what are the scriptural steps for bringing about forgiveness? There are three of them, as it turns out. Let's start at the beginning, shall we? Number one, first, go to the one who has sinned against you directly, one-on-one. I'll say that again because it's very important. First, go to the one who has sinned against you directly, one-on-one. In ancient times, Jewish teachers would have preferred that it didn't even get to this point. They would prefer that you would seek forgiveness against the one you have offended before they even had a chance to name it to you. This would nip things in the bud right away. Imagine what a positive impact this would have on any church family. If you were to accidentally or even purposefully offend somebody else, if you realized your fault, if you repented of your sin, and then asked for forgiveness before they even had a chance to point it out. Now that is called being proactive. Imagine what this would do for minimizing the times when folks get defensive or even try to deny that they have done anything wrong. 
However, the onus to seek forgiveness was not only on the offender. And certainly from personal experience, I bet there are many of you today who would testify about an experience when somebody offended you and they did not say, I'm sorry. Have you been there? Well, since this does happen, since offenders don't automatically ask for forgiveness, there is a need to confront them in a godly way, seeking not to harm them, but to win them over, as Jesus says. That's a key concept here, the concept of confrontation. It's a key concept in dealing with conflict in the church, and it is certainly a key concept in dealing with conflict in the world. After all, that's what the entire civil law or common law system in our country is all about. I don't know about you, but I love to watch those judge shows on TV sometimes. That's what they're all about. The plaintiff initiates a lawsuit against the defendant who has harmed them in one way or another. And so the plaintiff has the right to confront the defendant, to deal with the matter directly. But the ancient Jewish teachers, and certainly Jesus, did not desire for things to get that far unless it was absolutely necessary. The emphasis was going about confrontation in a godly way, to meet with the one who sinned against you in as private a way as possible, to do it directly, one-on-one, -on -one. because you see, to shame a brother or sister publicly, well, that was considered very serious business, something you only reserved for the most extreme circumstances. Well, what does this mean for First Baptist Church, this local manifestation of the community of forgiveness. Does it mean that if Wayne sins against Chris, that Chris should come and talk with Pastor Matt first? No, not at all. It means that Chris starts by talking with Wayne first, directly, one-on-one. -on -one. Does it mean that if Leslie has a problem with Peter, that she should go and talk with Jendi about it? Absolutely not. She needs to talk with Peter first, directly, again, one-on-one. -on -one. Does it mean that if Jendi somehow makes Chris angry, that Chris should come to Matt and the leadership of the church? Absolutely not. Chris needs to start by talking with Jendi first, directly, one-on-one. -on -one. You see, churches run a very high risk for what is known as triangulation. That could be the word of the day, triangulation. Do you know what that is? Well, it is an extremely dysfunctional, childish situation in which one person refuses to talk to a second person, but will communicate with a third person who gets drawn into the triangle. The first person ends up trying to get the third person to gang up with them against the second one. Well, this sort of phenomenon, which is so unhealthy, can happen in families, it can happen at the workplace, it can happen at school, and it can even happen in the church. And there is absolutely nothing godly or scriptural about it. And yet it is such an easy thing for us to slip into. It is part and parcel of our fallen sin nature. That's why Jesus gives to us, the church, the community of forgiveness, a much better way. The way to deal with conflict directly, to go and talk with the one who has sinned against you, first of all, one on one. And certainly the hope is that we would resolve our conflict, that the offending brother or sister will respond to the confrontation in a godly way, asking for forgiveness. And if this happens, as the scripture says, you will have won over your brother or sister. But, <laughs> there's a but here. But because the church is filled with fallen human beings like you and me, Jesus knew this, and we know also that this reconciliation will not always happen at step one. And you do not always win over your brother or sister at this point. This is why Jesus gave us step number two, which is, that if and only if step number one fails, go to them again with one or two brothers. That's the second step. One of the few things I remember from math class, geometry class actually, um, from high school, 
was the idea of doing logical proofs. I don't know if any of you remember that, um, but there was this funny little word that would pop up in those uh, geometric proofs, and it was spelled IFF. IFF, which meant if and only if. It's a pretty strong statement. And when we look at this second scriptural step that Jesus gives to the church about bringing, out forgive, bringing about forgiveness, the idea is that you only implement step number two if and only if step number one fails. In other words, you only go to the one who has sinned against you with one or two others, if and only if confronting them directly, one-on-one, -on -one, has failed. In the community of forgiveness, where we should all start with a foundation of childlike humility, where we all should desire not to cause others to stumble, and where we all should seek to imitate the heart of God who desires restoration rather than separation, we would all hope to minimize the cases where we even need to get to step number two, and especially step number three. However, it's not always possible. So in verse 16, Jesus anticipates this and says that if and only if your brother will not listen to you, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. This wasn't a new idea, folks. It was a very old idea. It was rooted deeply in God's law for Israel. Back in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, it says, One witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. This was an idea that continued on into the days of the early church as they took seriously Jesus' teaching on forgiveness and the idea of church discipline. The Apostle Paul referred to it when he wrote to the Corinthians, and here's what he said. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. What does this mean for First Baptist Church? Well, it means that if there is some problem between two people, that first of all, they need to make a real attempt at working it out between themselves. However, if that does not work, they need to involve a couple of other trusted individuals, not to gang up on the offender, but to serve as witnesses, to be of support in helping to bring about forgiveness and reconciliation in the community of forgiveness and reconciliation. And again, certainly the hope is that this will resolve the conflict. The offending brother or sister will respond to the confrontation in a godly way. They will ask for forgiveness and they will accept forgiveness. But again, because the church is filled with fallen human beings like you and me, we all know, and Jesus knew as well, that this does not always happen. And so there is also a step three, which is, that if and only if step two fails, involve the church in the process. That's step three. As we look at this third scriptural step, Jesus gives to the church for bringing about forgiveness. The idea is that you only implement step number three if and only if step number two fails. Do you see how there's an order? There's a sequence here. In other words, you only go public, so to speak, bringing the situation before the church if and only if involving the two or three, or I'm sorry, the one or two witnesses has failed. In the community of forgiveness, we should all seek to minimize the cases where we need to get this far. But this too is not always possible. Jesus knew this, and that's why in his great wisdom, he gave us step three. As I think about that fateful night at youth group so many years ago and the epic battle between John and Carlos, those two teenage boys, the big reason why forgiveness, why reconciliation was possible, the big reason why Carlos was able to forgive John was because they were both truly brothers in Christ. 
They were both believers committed to the community of forgiveness. They were willing to forgive one another because they knew the significance of the fact that God in Christ had forgiven them. But is that always the case in churches? Well, here's where it gets a little sticky. Is that always the case in churches? Is it always the case that a person who sins against you is a believer committed to the idea of forgiveness, committed to the community of forgiveness? Well, sadly and realistically, the answer sometimes is no. There are all sorts of reasons people go to church, and sometimes they are not the right reasons. Sadly, there are people who go to church to wield power and authority and not to serve God and other people in humility. Sadly, there are people who go to church to make a name for themselves and not to glorify God. There are people who think that sitting in a pew or even serving on a leadership group will get them into heaven, but they've totally missed the point about the idea that salvation is a free gift from God, forgiveness itself is a free gift from God. Now everyone needs Jesus, amen? Especially those who want to do stuff like this, those who would jockey for positions of leadership and uh, authority, like the disciples, by the way, are doing at the beginning of Matthew chapter 18, the chapter we are studying together, who just want to make themselves look good, who are foolishly trying to earn their salvation somehow, which is impossible to do anyway, right? However, when such a person sins against another person in church, and when he or she is unrepentant of that sin, even before or in front of the leaders of the church, what does Jesus say that the church should do with him or her? Well, this is the sad part. Here's what verse 17 says. Treat him or her as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Those are serious words. In other words, that's it. The church needs to cut them loose. It's called excommunication, actually. They were to no longer associate with the offenders as long as they were unrepentant. Why? Because Jesus was calling together a community of forgiveness. And such individuals who would be unwilling to participate in forgiveness, to accept forgiveness, to extend forgiveness, well, there comes a point at which it doesn't make any sense to keep hanging around. And yet it is with extreme sadness that any church would ever even get to this point. Because even though the reality of our fallen world makes this a necessary step in some extreme cases, The heart of God, and I want you to hear this, the heart of God is oriented toward restoration. Remember what he said in Matthew 18, verse 14. Your father, listen, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. So those are the three scriptural steps for bringing about forgiveness. First, go to the one who has sinned against you directly one-on-one. Second, if and only if step number one fails, go to them again with one or two other people. And then step three, if step two fails, if and only if step number two fails, involve the church in the process. And as we look at verses 18 through 20, it becomes clear that, as it will say in your notes if you're looking at those, the supervision of this process of forgiveness and reconciliation was uniquely entrusted to the leaders of the community of forgiveness. But we don't have time to talk about that today. We'll talk about it next time. But I don't want you to forget now the big idea of this particular passage, which is simply this that Jesus gives us clear steps for bringing about forgiveness. Jesus gives us clear steps for bringing about forgiveness. And these steps that he gives us will help us to know what to do even in the toughest situations in the church and in our lives in general. 
Jesus started out the whole conversation out by saying this, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Those of us who are parents have seen our little children fight with each other. We know that they'll do it. Well, likewise, God knew that. We would have problems with this as well. That's why he gave us some very practical instructions on how to deal with it. How to deal with conflict in a constructive way that actually works. Because guess what? We are God's little kids. Because we are like that one lost sheep for whom he leaves behind the other 99 to seek us back. To seek us back to restore us. Because God wants us to look each other in the eye. To overcome the barriers that separate us from each other and to forgive each other. Because as the one who went to the cross for you, Jesus looks at you in the eye. He is the one who has already overcome all your sin in order to remove the barrier between you and God so that you could be forgiven yourself. I'd like to invite you to join me in a special time of prayer as we consider the implication of what it means to be the community of forgiveness. As we pray, I would ask you the question, just between you and the Lord, who have you sinned against? Will you in this moment pray for the courage to go and ask for forgiveness? Who has sinned against you? Will you pray for the courage to start a dialogue with them and to work it out? Do you need to move on to step two? How can you call on some trustworthy individuals to help you out? Think about forgiveness. Dear God, I pray in this moment for the leaders of our own church to consider these important steps that you have given to your church so that we can apply them here at First Baptist, so that we can truly become a community of forgiveness. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness and reconciliation in our society and in the world and that the church would be at the forefront of that because we are called to be the community of forgiveness. Dear God, I pray for families, for uh, couples, for friends out there who need to find forgiveness and who need to seek reconciliation in their own lives. And dear God, I pray for the one today who is listening to this message and who is experiencing the need for forgiveness directly from you. May they know that forgiveness is always, always, always freely available to them because of what Jesus has done on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today. Remember that you can always get in contact with us if you'd like by emailing us at prayer at fbc-portland.org. And now, go with this blessing. May the God of forgiveness, may the God of love and grace go with you. May your paths be easy. May your burdens be light. May you always walk in the ways of peace. In the name of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.